Good afternoon, traders. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, that is afternoon Chicago time. Recognize that the world doesn't revolve around Chicago. Uh, thanks for joining us today. It is 3.30 p.m. Chicago time on Wednesday, the 14th of April, 2021. This session here is really focused on the components that go into um, creating setups for market profiling. This will be uh, recorded and sent to all registrants. There are a lot of you. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. So what are we covering today? Today's objectives are to look at, um, to provide you with an overview of volume profiling in general. This is something that uh, I have done a ton of work on. After being a high volume scalper, I decided to move out of the competition with HFTs and market makers and to look for a better way to trade, meaning moving up in time frame. And after testing out a whole bunch of indicators and approaches, um, including FIBs, using FIBs, moving averages, uh, indicators like RSI, CCI, and others, um, I, I fell upon market profiling, got very serious about it, did a lot of study on it, and then after a while I started to notice the market has relatively consistent, in my opinion, behavior uh, when uh, it approached areas where the volume at price was of a certain magnitude. I don't remember if I read this out or not, but derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. The opinions and experience shared here is mine and my mine alone and does not reflect those uh, of convergent trading, its officers and so on. So today we'll cover an overview of volume profiling. We'll also uh, tr help you see that the market action is a narrative. And in other words, the auction is a continuous story. We're gonna talk about that quite a bit. We will also help you see inside the bar or group of bars to identify what is happening inside of a bar. Most of us are familiar with bar charts or candlestick charts or PNF uh, PNF charts or range bars or whatever. Uh, and we could see the price action. We could see we could see where the bar opened, uh, where it put in a high, where it put in a low, where it put in a close. What we're doing with volume profiling is taking almost an X-ray of those bars and seeing what's inside. Where did volume trade a lot? Where was volume rejected? And we can do this across many periodicities or time frames. So we're gonna look at that for a little bit. Uh, and that sets up the core of what we're here for today to look at some basic setups and drill down to see what the execution on those would look like. So bear with me as we go through the details here. I know many of you have probably covered uh, volume profiling or have heard me or have, uh, have uh, uh, participated in the charity webinar series I did about 10 years ago, but this stuff is evolving. Uh, and then finally, at the end of the session, we're gonna do a pop quiz. We're actually gonna put up a poll and see how much you retained. We'll share the results. There are about seven questions. We'll see if you get them all right. Do it for perfection, of course. So let's dive in. Volume profiling. Um, what volume profiling is and what it isn't. So. What is volume profiling? Volume profiling is simply a way of organizing market information uh, by charting the amount of volume that has traded at each price. So all of us are familiar with uh, volume bars. You have your candlesticks above and then below, you have these bars that sh pop up on the screen at the bottom and in general, usually at the bottom, and they reflect how much volume has been traded. And of course, of course, 
The volume never goes negative. There's never negative volume on a bar on the time scale. But what we do here is we turn it on its side. Um, we turn it on its side and we display the volume by price. Okay, so that's what a volume profile is. Well, I'll show you what a profile uh, volume profile looks like. The one thing you want to remember about volume profiling is it's not a way of trading. It's not an indicator. It's not a trading setup. It's none of that. Um, so can someone give me a mic check? Is my mic coming across uh, nice and clear? Just to check. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so here's what a profile looks like. This is a typical volume profile. Uh, the This is a histogram that's been tipped on its end, uh, which is tipped on its end. And very simply, it is uh, describing how much volume. And with the software that I'm using and the data feed that I'm using, I'm I know that to the tick, right? So it's bringing that in at the tick level and it's showing me how much volume traded at each price. In this profile, it's really important to indicate the when the volume profile starts and when it finishes. This particular profile that's in front of you here starts at the beginning of the session at RTH in the RTH session, in other words, 9:30 Eastern U.S. time with the New York uh, New York um, with a Wall Street open, and it stops 15 minutes after the cash open, which was what we call the pit or RTH session in the futures. So, it is describing all the volume that has taken place across the entire range that has traded, actually traded between 9:30 and 4:15 Eastern U.S. time on a given day on this what you see in the blue area so that's the entire gray area what you see in the blue area is what's called the value area the value area is a statistical um is a statistical result what we do here we're trying to des describe the first standard deviation of a histogram what is the standard uh, first standard deviation? The first standard deviation, or one sigma, describes what we would consider as normal people, what we would consider to be normal. It represents 68.2. We round it to 70% for simplicity. It represents 68.2% of the volume or the samples, in this case we use volume, in the data set except because life doesn't make it so that everything is so beautifully distributed evenly the 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 value area is computed around the mode the mode in statistics is the price or uh data that occurs the most that has the highest volume or occurs the most in that histogram we call that the volume point of control so we determine where the volume of point of control is. Why does that matter? Because sometimes the profile is fat at the top or fat at the bottom or fat two thirds of the way up or two, -thir one -third of, uh, two thirds of the way down. So what we do is we figure out the value area around the point of control. And then of course this chart, so that's the blue area. And then of course this chart also shows uh, also shows the point of control, which is that dark red line. That simply represents the most traded price for that session. We consider that um, we consider that the the uh, the most uh, accepted price, uh, the most traded price, and therefore the most accepted price. So these are the basic components of a volume profile. So that's the display. What is the volume profile showing us? So we have bars that may overlap for a session, but what a volume profile shows us is wh at which prices did the auction facilitate a lot of trading? Or at which price did the buyers and sellers agree across the range and therefore traded a lot? 
So I've used this example a lot in the past. If I believe that an iPhone 12 should sell for $900 and I want an iPhone 12 and it's being offered at my local store for $900, then there's nothing that inhibits me from going and buying that. And it doesn't inhibit anybody else from going and buying it. So you're selling at what's called the fair price and, and or fair value. What happens is, what if all of a sudden, I know this thing's selling for 900 bucks, but it's now selling for $1,500. Well, a bunch of people are still going to be able to go and pay $1,500 for a phone that normally, with a point of control, at $900, but there's going to be less of them because other people are going to choose an alternative if there is. Others might choose to just wait and so on and so forth. So we, when price has moved up, now the demand has dropped and what we're looking for is for the seller to come down in price and the seller now has to come back down in price to a point to attract enough buyers to facilitate trading again because the purpose, and again, I want you to hear this carefully, the purpose of the market is to facilitate trade. It's just one big auction like eBay or whatever, except it's a two-way auction. You and I can be buyers or sellers, uh, either of size or small. Uh, in trading, we can become, we can play on both sides and we do so very fluidly and uninhibited. It's inhibited in stocks because you have uh, restrictions on shorts, uh, short trading. You have the day trade pattern day trader rule. You have all these restrictions but in futures we don't have uh, a finite number of shares we can create as many contracts as as people are willing to trade there's no limit to the number of contracts that can be generated and we can be long or short without any restrictions on our uh, futures trading account so uh so in in doing so we see with a profile where prices were trading a lot and where prices failed to trade and therefore thinned out and therefore there's no volume. This cannot be seen with a bar chart. It cannot be seen with a candlestick chart. It cannot be seen with a point and figure range bar or any other chart, but volume profiles. Okay, and that's the edge of volume profiles. The main um, the main conditions that the market can be in as part of the auction is it's either in balance or another word that people use in trading is coiling, consolidating. It basically describes consensus. The market has taken all of the information, has determined that crude oil should be trading at 62.86 currently. We all accept this price, and so we trade and trade and trade and trade, and we get a lot of volume at that price because everybody's happy with that price. It's a bargain for the buyers, and it's a bargain for the sellers, and therefore trading is facilitated there, and therefore we create a point of control in that price region. But when the market is out of balance, what happens? Let me quiz you, let me pre let me pre-pop quiz you. Is a market trending, does that mean there are more buyers than sellers, especially in futures? Is that what causes a market to trend? Think about it. There are more buyers than sellers and therefore the market moves up. There are more sellers than buyers, therefore the market moves down, right? Wrong, wrong. There's always the, uh, a buyer for every seller, and there's always a seller for every buyer. If one side does, is not there, then there is no transaction. It never makes it on our charts. We never see it happen, period. There's no such thing as there are more buyers than sellers. It, it, it cannot exist. What you have is a more aggressive set of buyers willing to take higher prices, but the volume always describes two participants offsetting each other every single time. So price can jump from 
crude oil, for example, from $62 and jump immediately to $63. Wow, that is 100 ticks. And trade a one lot. And trade a one lot. All it has to do is just trade a one lot. Why? Because there's a gap between those willing to buy at 62 and those willing to sell the best the best offers at 63 and if i'm aggressive enough to want to buy those 63s and i want to buy a one lot i just registered a one lot traded for one contract and it just shows up on my volume profile as a gap with one contract traded at 63 there was somebody still had to be there but it's the, it didn't go through $62 and a penny, two cents, three cents, four cents, all the way up to 99 cents. It didn't trade those prices, it just skipped them. It just gapped through them, okay? So when the market is trending, it's out of balance. The perspective on what value is, is out of balance, and the market will trend in a direction, let's say to the buy side, it'll continue to trend in that direction until, until such, point where it attracts sellers the only reason the market moves up is to attract sellers as a mechanism that doesn't mean I, the only reason i'm buying is to attract sellers that's different that's the point of view of the trader or the participant but looking at a, at a higher level from 20,000 feet looking down the way the machine works is the market trends up and continues to trend up until it finds sellers. And its purpose is to find that seller. It'll continue to move in that direction incessantly, kind of like the uh, indices in the US right now, until it finds aggressive sellers, until it finds people who are willing to participate on the sell side. The market will advertise prices or trade lower until it finds buyers, period. So. A market that's in balance is one that has absorbed all of the information, has determined that the price range it's in is acceptable and is just coiling and facilitating trade. A market that is out of balance is one that where one side or the other sees prices as disadvantageous and so it moves aggressively in a single direction in a trend, in what we call a trend. The other thing you need to know about volume profiling is that it can describe action intraday, so I can take one bar, one 30-minute bar or five-minute bar and look at its volume profile and see something. It tells me something. I can look at the daily. I can look at the whole session. I can look at the pit and compare it to the whole session. I can look at a micro composite. A micro composite is when we take several profiles and combine them and to see what the big picture is. So as a swing trader, I'm gonna wanna look at a micro composite. As an options trader, I'm gonna wanna look at a micro composite. I'm gonna wanna see where, where did a lot of people trade? Because you know what? People are holding positions at those prices and we're, we're liable to see a, a, a reaction at the key areas. Key areas me, me, meaning prices that were highly accepted versus prices that were quickly rejected. And then there are composite profiles, and composite profiles are simply profiles that cover everything. They're, they they may go back years and show you what the action has looked like at each price for years and years and years, and it only limits your data, okay? So the question becomes, as somebody who's maybe unfamiliar with volume profiling is, doesn't my candlestick chart already tell me everything I need to know? I mean, why are you complicating things by doing this volume profiling mumbo jumbo? Actually, your candlestick chart doesn't tell you everything, unless of course you're satisfied with what's, what it's already telling you and you don't wanna look far, uh, further in and, and see what's happening inside. So let's look at what the consensus versus um, versus trend. So balance versus imbalance, just to describe to you what is going on here. Let me get my trusty little pen. So this is today, but this is today up till about 3 p.m. Eastern when I took the snapshot. Okay, so this is the ES, the ES 
today. This is the last few days, Tuesday, there's Tuesday, Monday, Friday, and so on, okay? What this is telling us is the story. What you have is the market opened here, closed here, this is the high, this is the low, okay? So that's, a candlestick chart is just gonna show you this part, that's it. But what exactly happened inside? Within that candlestick, could you see that the market accepted this big price down here at 41.04? That that's the most traded price for the session? Can you see that it actually, the market had some consensus through most of the session and then it broke out later at this 41.04 and a quarter price? I remember it from Friday. It broke out later and then it developed consensus at the high of the day. Does your candlestick chart tell you that even though we opened inside of the upper distribution of Friday on Monday, we accepted this upper distribution, meaning we traded quite a bit here, we broke higher, we consolidated, and we never went back. So the market is accepting and therefore trading a lot in the upper distribution here. That was Monday. Later in the session, because it opened down here and it closed up here and it made a high up here, later in the session, it shifted acceptance to higher prices above and beyond what Friday showed. This is what this chart, these volume profiles are telling me. Otherwise, I'm just looking at a candlestick chart and it's like, oh, low, higher low, higher high versus the other session. Oh, higher low higher high versus, that is true. The price action is describing a trend on a day-to-day -day basis. But what it's not telling us is how is value moving? Value is the blue, blue area, remember? This is value. How is the point of control moving? The point of control is shifting with price. This means that the market is in a healthy trend, okay? And then today, the story changed. Can you see how the story changed? Because you know what? The candlestick shows we opened up here, and at this point, we the last price was down here around 41.25. It looks like it tested as far down as almost the prior day's low at 41.15. Uh, so it stopped short of 41.15 on the retest, and it made a high up here at 41.43 or so. Okay, my prices are not going to be exact. I'm just throwing ballpark figures. You know, the fact is, this is the most traded. This is the most, uh, this is the product to trade the most, right? So I, I remember these from memory because I have to understand the narrative. And the goal of the volume profile is to tell you this narrative. What do you see about today's profile that is unusual? Whereas somebody following price action is going to say, higher high, higher low, everything is the same. It all continues the same way. So the narrative here is this. The narrative is that we started the prior days on the low end, accepted prices on the low end, and then finished with a higher distribution and acceptance because the auction is showing us where the volume was. Volume was up here near the close. It didn't stay, this didn't come back here. Didn't put in a higher, higher, higher low and come back and finish at the low end of the range. Price is being accepted higher, price is being accepted higher. Today, we started just like prior days. We accepted higher prices, but what did we do? We later broke lower. That didn't happen here, that didn't happen here, that didn't happen here. There's something unusual about this day. So this is an important indication that there is a potential stall taking place. The market is potentially stalling here. And what confirms that to me? Where does it close versus the, the volume of the prior days, right? So currently the market's trading around 41.22. So we finished down here. This is the first time where we have, we leave value 
and acceptance above us, and we finish lower versus these prior days. The candlestick doesn't tell me that. It just says, oh, we opened up here, we closed down here, which is unusual. But we, what we don't see is it accepted these prices most of the day. This is expected to be fuel to help push prices even higher. And instead, it fueled a drop. Of course, this is on news. But this is what the volume profile is telling us. The other piece of information you should know is that even though I'm looking at a daily, I can switch this chart into a 60-minute chart and the profile won't change. I can see this in a five-minute chart. I can chart a five-minute chart for the whole day and I'd have bars going like this, whatever, for the entire day and the volume profile won't change. It just won't change. And so that's really important because now we're getting almost an untainted view of what the market is doing. One thing to note, the value area is just because the program computes it doesn't mean that it's valid. A value area, if we took a normal distribution, it looks like this. The point of control and the average are usually the same price and the value area fits nice and neat on each side, it's worth 31.2, no, 31.4, something like that, 31.4%, and it's beautiful. Real life is not this neat, right? And so a lot of times, we have to look at the profile, and if it's stretched with multiple distributions, this is a trending day, this is an imbalance day, there is no value area. It's nonsense. These blue lines are nonsense. So you have to know enough to understand that when the market is out of balance, how could there be value? That by definition, if it's out of balance, there is no value. It's seeking balance. And so this day is a trend day. This day is a double distribution balancing day as opposed to a double distribution trend. This is a double distribution trend day. It's got two clear distributions and a stretch profile. today. I don't know where we ended up, but this is a relatively balanced profile with a break. So this is a, a balance that broke into imbalance to the downside. Okay, some important distinctions for you to note. This is not academic, folks. This is understanding when I'm doing my homework, these little facts are really important. So let's talk about the trading narratives. The trading narrative is really focused on several pieces. It's focused on where did we open versus the prior auction? Did we gap up? Did we gap down? Did we, did we open in value? Did we open out of value? Did we open uh, on top of the prior day's point of control? These all describe different things. There are five locations that the market can open it. Again, it can open above the prior day's range, so there's imbalance of the, to the buy side. It can open below yesterday's range. It can open inside of the value area within yesterday's uh, uh, range to the downside, below the point of control. It can open inside of the value area, um, above the point of control or above the value area and then it can also open right on top of the point of control so it it there's there it's describing uh, am i above the range am i above and below the value area inside of the range or am i inside of the value area or the acceptance area within the range five different scenarios every single day okay and so where it opens and what it does next to unfold the auction, what it does, you know, we opened here, we tested down, and then we pushed up. We, were, we saw aggressive buying, we saw weak pullbacks, therefore I'm gonna get long, my setups to get long, and so on and so forth. And this creates the if-then-else principle, which is basically the narrative or the context. Why do you care? Now, if you're an automated, trader of, of some kind, you don't care. 
you could just turn on the machine and it does what it does, right? You're relying on probabilistic outcomes or statistics. You don't really care to read the story. But if you're someone who is building a career in trading and hopes to one day be able to trade a 30 lot in the minis or 20 lot in crude or to stop taking trades holding on to losses and then but when a trade goes your way you just want to lock in that profit immediately and so you're not able to get yourself to be unemotional about trading and therefore you're interfering with the outcome of a trade generally the causes of that are the the lack of belief in your edge a lack of understanding of the market and most importantly a lack of understanding of the narrative of what the market is generally doing because i know that if i'm trading with the narrative and the market moves against me it's okay as long as my risk is defined and i accept it it is okay you know those sayings the trend is your friend let winners run cut losers short these sound good these sound like they're summarizing what a winning trader does. They're total and absolute BS if you don't have an understanding of the market. How do you let a winner run? What, what does that mean? How far do you let it run? When, when can you tell a winning trade is no longer a winning trade? And if you have, have an understanding of what the narrative is, which is basically the day-to-day -day story that builds in the market, then it's easier to understand when a trade is moving against you slightly, it's easier to understand and be rooted and know that the basis of your trade is uh, the bigger picture, the bigger trend, right? So you can do that, of course, with higher time frame moving averages. You know, I execute, let's say someone can come in here and say, well, I ex execute off of a, a four period over an eight period moving average cross but I managed to trade with a 21 moving average. You can do it that way, but none of that means anything if the market is not shifting value and accepting value by generating volume higher and higher and higher up the price ladder, okay? And here you are wanting to be long. If it's failing to continue to move the value area of the point of control up to a higher price session after session, it's just a matter of time before somebody steps in and sells the living heck out of it because they see before you did that it's not able to uh, raise prices up the ladder. So the narrative is really important. Let's look at today. This is today's chart. I'm keeping it very simple here. Today's chart simply has bars, this is a four tick Renko, so we get a new bar every time the market has a four tick counter move, okay? And I'm showing the opening price. So today we open at 41.32.25. So this is the narrative part. This is what I highly recommend you do on a constant basis. You can do it by pulling up a chart and just looking at it like we're doing, or by using a, the replay function or whatever in your software and then walking it forward, walk forward. I don't need this profile here. Walking it forward bar by bar and just reading to yourself what it's already done. So this is one of our setups here, by the way, we'll talk about in a minute. This is one of our setups. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cover that, but look at what it did. It opened just underneath the upper distribution left behind from yesterday. Notice that the most volume from yesterday was left behind at 41.23.75. That volume was generated in this zipper here, this consolidation zone, and then we broke out. Remember, it hit 41.26.50, uh, uh, 41.26.50, put in a lower high. It pulled back quite deep right to the open. Right, this was uh, yesterday morning, yesterday late morning, and then boom, it exploded to the upside, breaking this double top at 2650. And so we left behind this point of control at the upper end of Monday's range. This looks the same as it did on Friday, okay? That's fine. 
So we broke higher and we maintained higher prices enough to generate another distribution or high volume node at the upper end of the range. This is telling us a lot here. The market has moved up and it hasn't really rejected these prices before the close. Today, it gapped down internally versus the prior day's open. The prior day's close is right here at 34 and a quarter. It opened at 32 and a quarter. It pulled back to where? It pulled back to the low volume node. So this is still this range from here to here is the range of rejection or imbalance. And it ran right through these prices and generated a low volume node, what's called an LVN. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And what it did this morning is it tested the LVN. And then, you know, I was expecting it to move to 27. I was hoping it would move to 27. It tested the LVN and it rotated and started and rejected the LVN and started to move in that direction. This is our double distribution LVN fade setup. Okay, this is a, a fade setup in between two distributions. That's, set, that's the first setup we're going to discuss. But let's go through the narrative. Here we're playing bar by bar, and then you can see the trend very quickly takes out the new, the last all-time high, generates an all-time high, new all-time high, very shallow, shallow pullback. So you continue to describe the narrative. We don't have the profile at the moment, but we can generate one right here. Okay, so you can see it's a mishmash. Um, it's a mishmash of stuff here. And it's trading, it's basically creating this blunt profile so far. We continue, we shift the point of control up, and then we start to falter and fail to hold these higher prices, right? We try to hold these higher prices, but it keeps being magnetized and being pulled back to 41.39. See that? It's just, it's struggling to keep these higher prices, and now it's starting to explore lower after moving below the developing point of control of 4140 it's not able to retest created a small ledge retested from below a ledge is another setup we're going to talk about and then it's starting to expand down the value area is starting to expand down and unless it rejects and comes back up rejects the open and comes back up it is likely to consolidate and break lower why because it's not able to bring in the buyers in an aggressive way to keep exploring prices higher in a sense it has temporarily for now found sellers of 4144 and it's not able to hold on and attract buyers on pullbacks to push through the 4144 it is likely to break to the low side remember the trend is against you here on the short side so any short trades are likely to be short term and then it extends lower. So what we've done so far is test and accept these higher prices from yesterday afternoon's high, but we are giving that up. And so tomorrow, depending on what it does tonight in the extended trading hours, if it's not able to recover 41.37.50, tomorrow you'll hear me talking about stocking short trades for the first time in probably a month. Um, so. That's what we're looking for. We're looking now for a retest of the value area from below 41.32.33 and so on. You see the value area expanding down. So now we're accepting these lower and lower prices and that's what looks different. It's hard to read that from the candlestick chart. See that? So now after attempting to push higher and being rejected, again, we rejected where we're rejected at the prior day's low volume node, which is this morning's low, we test by a few ticks, reject away, new lows, lower high, new lows, and then we're accepting these prices down here. We're, we're, we're forming a uh, high volume node. Let's turn off extending these VPOX. So we're, we're, we're moving away from the most accepted price. We're generating this profile at the bottom, these high volume nodes in the, in the bottom, which we haven't done in a while. That's very informative. And that's what the narrative is, the if then else narrative is. And that's really your job. It's really important to keep a handle on it. 
trading narratives. This, this brings me to convergent trading. One of the things that people are missing as they trade, and this is not a sales pitch, if you know, you can ignore it if you're not interested, but the one of the most important things that we're missing is the ability to check our logic against what other people are doing. And so I've been trading for 21 years. I still pay attention to what the other traders that you see here, this is a screenshot from today's uh, discussion on Convergent, uh, Convergence Head Trader Channel, which is only reserved for approved head traders. Uh, there are four of us. And I'm constantly checking what other people trading my product are doing and saying this. it's important to have that check, especially from someone you know or believe is competent. So the issues for most traders are either lack of capital, lack of edge, lack of emotional awareness and discipline, lack of accountability, or lack of uh, the, uh, or isolation, right? The, the inability to check what you're doing versus what others are doing. And that's where being part of a, you know, if it's not conversion, it's a discord, whatever. But the problem with the discord, whatever, discord channel, or whatever, is you don't know what the other person is doing really or who they are They have not been vetted. I'm going to throw this in here because that's what I have to do. Uh, for those of you who are not part of Convergent, you can go to go, dot, uh, go to ct.pro forward slash April 21 offer. You can join Convergent for a lower price. This offer is extended for seven days. I'm putting it here because I want to get it out of the way. Uh, but for those of you who are interested, go to ct.pro forward slash April 21 offer and type in this coupon code VPAPRIL21 and it gives you a reduction 20 days. I, we don't do trials. I suggest you take uh, a 30-day membership, just one month, and come in so that you can experience this process um, you know, of not only communicating on a daily basis in the, in the various channels, especially the Head Trader channel, but to talk about the market twice a week, one in our trade talk on Tuesday and one in our study halls on Thursday. So let's move on. Volume profile areas that matter. What matters? Where's the value price? Where's the consensus? Where's the acceptance? Where are prices being rejected? These are taper areas. These are low volume nodes. These are areas like that. What is the most accepted price? The volume point of control. Where is the bulk of the volume being traded? These are high volume nodes. These are also accepted areas. High volume nodes and the volume point of control, two different things. You need a high volume node. You need a node, an area or range to be the highest volume for it to have to take over and become the point of control area and the value area. Then there are low volume nodes, which are areas of rejection like I showed based on today's narrative, again, as I said, we came in, we immediately rejected, we immediately rejected, let me get rid of this profile here. Oh. Yeah, it's not the profile. Here we go. So, we came in, we immediately rejected the low volume nodes. We started in a high volume node, moved to a low volume node, rejected, turned, put in new highs. Okay. And then the last piece, there are many pieces, but the last piece I'm going to cover is the ledges. Ledges. Okay. Ledges are areas where the market has a lot of volume and then in the very next tick, it has no volume. It has no volume at all. So there's a huge disparity between acceptance and lack of acceptance. That leaves us with a ledge. Ledges are often retested areas and are good setups for a pullback or a breakout. We'll show you that in a minute. So let's talk about trading setups. The first setup I'd like to talk about is a dust, double distribution LVN fade. This has already been discussed. I have a double distribution profile, okay? Um, I have a double distribution profile. 
which means I have a high volume node with a very low volume node where prices were rejected, volume was rejected, and then I have another high volume node. So a double distribution profile looks something like this high volume, looks like a big B. Okay. And what this does is it gives us a very clear zone of rejection. Lots and lots of trading here, lots and lots of trading here. And for some reason, the price in between is rejected. This is what this setup is. And this is what we saw yesterday. So we have an upper distribution, a lower distribution, the market has tested. And what this setup does is, and again, trade your way. This is not a recommendation to trade, but what the double distribution does is it creates a very clear risk range, right? So let's carry this over. Let's carry this line over. So we have a low volume node, basically at 41.29. And then that node continues down to 25. Within that node is this double top and rejection, a breakout area at 27. Ooh, that five looks awful, doesn't it? 25. So within that zone, I know that if I'm going to look for a long, again, the daily trend is up, the weekly trend is up, we are opening at the upper distribution of the prior day, so all, all things point to buying pullbacks. Wouldn't you agree that the type of market we're in is one where we're looking to buy pullbacks? And so where do I buy a pullback? The first place to buy a pullback is at the low volume node on a double distribution day. We don't get a lot of double distribution days. When they happen, it's very clear. If the market, if I go to buy the 29, 27, 25 zone, let's say I'm scaling in, and then it breaks through 25 and it starts to have weak counter rotations, weak, that's, that's an out, that's a stop. So looking for 29 really allowing for about four points currently, four, uh, three and a half points of range is enough uh, in the ES. Again, do your own homework. That's not a recommendation to trade, but overall, I'm trading against this low volume node, but I have to give this trade room to about 25. Once it gets through 25, especially if it rejected the 27 breakout point from yesterday, this trade isn't gonna work, right? So that's our risk. Our risk is four points, okay? So four points on this LVN fade. What is my target? My target is the weak double top from yesterday. That's the big target. So I'm looking at 29, right? Up to 41 or so. Uh, yesterday's, yesterday's high, what was yesterday's high? Was it 30? I believe it was 41. Call it 40, 39.75, I guess. That's the target. So now I have a target of, let's call it 10 points, 39. Okay? So this is a 2.5 R trade. Any trade that gives me a multiple of risk that is 1.15 or better is worth looking at. On a large enough data set, on a large enough data set, trading 1.15R, I'm expecting to be at least break even, if not better, depending on my costs. So 2.5R, boom, we have our risk factor. It's just a matter of detecting uh, where our execution is going to be. Execution is a whole different ball of wax. We can talk about execution for two hours. I use order flow for execution. I look for rejections. I look for the market pushing, 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 and, it, and is unable to push through to the downside. So either an iceberg is there or it's pushing and popping quickly up, pulling back, trying to push through again and popping quickly up. I'm looking to lift the market and I'm looking to catch the trade on the, on the upside. This trade here, 
The, the best catch here is at 32.50. So unless I have a resting order, uh, a resting order at 29, the best I can do is catch it at 32.50 uh, or so to 39. That gives me, or let's call it 32 to 39, gives me seven points. And then now I'm really taking a, a wide risk and I'm bringing the R factor to about 1.3. Still valid, not great. Okay, so that's where that uh, stands. Um, that's where that stands. So this is that particular trade. So let's move on. I know time is running out because I still want to send you this pop quiz. So what is the next? So that's a simple setup, purely volume profile based. There are many, many setups in the tool chest, but this one is purely volume profile based. So now we want to talk about a ledge, the ledge trade. And the ledge trade, the ledge trade, so I'm going to show you a ledge. And ledges don't occur very often, but in this situation, let's just go back a few days. So we're going to go back to the fifth. So the fifth, what happened? We gapped up. We had a big gap. This was a gap and go situation. And we started, I'm going to create a profile. Uh, actually, let me just draw it. And I'm going to walk you through what happened on this day. Let's make this a little bit better. This profile I just drew, uh, custom profile. Where are you, buddy? Here you go. So the custom profile, let's just make it yellow for clarity. Let's make it a hologram. Okay, don't need all these things. Okay. So here's how things looked. We gapped up and we have a strong open. We have a gap and go situation. Uh, and so the market is in a state of imbalance. So we already know it's in a state of imbalance. How? How do we know it's already in a state of imbalance? Anybody? I'm going to give you five seconds. Come on. Right. It's already gapped. It's already gapped. It's already told us that it's rejected prior prices. Look at where the prior day is. If we like these prices down here in the 4,000 range, we would be down here in the morning. We're not. We have gapped through by the time it opened the next day. So we have gapped. And so the question is, do we gap and reverse or do we gap and go? How do we know if it's going to gap and reverse or gap and go? Five seconds. How do we know ahead of time? If you said you have some tool that tells you what that's going to be, I'll, I'm going to call your bluff and tell you you're full of it. There's no way to know. So what you want to see is if it pushes it directionally, puts in a high opening swing, and then pulls back and crosses that opening line that opening price. This is the green line here is the opening price. Okay. Let's actually clarify it here. It's supposed to be a dotted line width of one. Okay. So that's the opening price. If it's not able to get back to the opening price, you have a gap and go situation. You do not want to be short in this environment. Okay. I'm not short there, buddy. Now what? So now I'm looking for ledges. I'm looking for areas where the market is giving me a chance to trade against a uh, volume area that is, um, that is being rejected. So we don't see that here. We see the point of control shifting in the first few bars. And we keep shifting forward and forward and forward. And all of a sudden, we have this ledge. Does, does everybody see the ledge? This is a ledge. So right here, in this inside of this bar, so remember, we're only looking this far. This has not occurred yet. This bar hasn't occurred. This bar hasn't occurred. None of these bars have occurred, okay? 
we see a large drop off in volume. This is a blow off top. This is zip, stops get run. Remember, there was a 50 here, push through 50. It's a mid century figure, pushes through the 50. There's no volume on that push. The next thing I expect it to do is rotate back. Where does it rotate back to? My expectation is it rotates back likely to the mid or the developing point of control, which is right here. So, so far, the developing point of control, 11,000, 12,000 contracts have traded here. You can see there's a big disparity above and below. But what we have here is a ledge. What do I do with this ledge? This ledge is important because as the market pushes through, if the market finds a higher low, finds a bottom, and pushes through, I'm looking to buy this ledge on one of two scenarios. One, a breakout from the inside of the, of the day outward. So I'm looking for a breakout. The ledge is likely to be the breakout point, which it was here. But you missed the breakout. Tough luck. Can we do something else with this? What do you think? You have five seconds. Can we do something else if we miss the breakout? The retest, the pullback. What do you do? You get the retest right here. So number two, we get the fade or the pullback fade, the pullback trade, the fade. So you had an opportunity at the breakout trade at this price, right, 40, 50, or you had an opportunity on the pullback. Both are valid, okay? And that's the next, that's the ledge retest trade. Very, very simple stuff. You, uh, for these, you use either structural stops or you use a fixed stop, or use a fixed stop for me for these kinds of trades. If I have the ideal situations, I have a point of control a little bit higher. So I'll tell you what the ideal risk reward situation here is the point of control is here instead of here. Down here, it's too low, 45. I'm buying the breakout one tick above the 50, right? In this case. So five points, mm, not a fan. I'm not a swing trader, not a fan. So I have to use a fixed stop in this situation. I have to use a three and a half point stop. In fact, back here wasn't three and a half points. Ranges have collapsed. Collapsed. It's four and a quarter points statistically based on the volatility. And so the stop here would be somewhere around 46 or so from 50 quarter, 46. And if if it gets if 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 it gets down into the point of control and starts visiting the other side i'm out i'm not waiting for the entire stop because it, if i'm correct in that there's a break here it should not and i use the word should not lightly very very lightly here it should not or it's not expected to get through all of this volume that was formed in this point of control that should be backing my trade up okay might have lost you there, but that's that's the ideal situation. But the market's not always ideal in the way in the way we trade it. So that's the ledge. Now let's wrap it up with uh, now these trades. I I will look for these trades throughout the session. You have to understand the caveats. There's a big caveat between trading in the first hour and a half of the day to two hours. So the first two hours contain the Wall Street open at 9.30 and the European close at 11.30 Eastern. Those are the prime hours. These are hours where you don't want to be uh, 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 distracted by deliveries or uh, parenting or caretaking or phone calls or YouTube or whatever. This is the important part of the day. We understand that anything executed during that time is handled the same way. You can still trade, take setups because you're there to take setups as a trader. After that period, after the European session, after 11.30, but you have a caveat in that you may be a sitting duck for a long period of time on those other trades. And so not a huge fan, especially fading 
especially fading the trend during that period, 11.30 to about 3.30. Not a huge fan of the that period, but sometimes their best setups occur during that, that time period, especially breakout type setups like today. You know, market broke down. So let's do the pop quiz and I'll let you guys head out um, right after that. Let's start out with this question. Here you go. You can select your answer from right there. I'm gonna keep these up in the, in the interest uh, in the interest of time. I'm only gonna keep these up for about 20 seconds each, or seven questions. Okay. The question here is: Volume profiling can help day traders and scalpers, swing traders, investors, or all of the above. Who does this apply to? Who do you think volume profiling um, applies to based on the question, based on the uh, the answers that I provide or the information that I provided? Okay, I'm going to close this one. Here's how you guys voted. 86% of you got this right. It is not constrained by time. As I'm looking at options three weeks out, volume profile. As I look at multi days to figure out what the market is doing when it's in a multi day balance, volume profile across several days. So that's almost like swing trading. If I'm looking at a tick chart and I'm looking to determine what the market has done so far for the day, volume profile. It does not care about the, uh, the uh, periodicity. Doesn't, it's not constrained by time, okay? The second question, here you go. You have 20 seconds. What does volume profiling show that other tools do not? You can only choose one answer. You've got about six seconds. Okay, I'm gonna put that away. If you can't vote because you're on an, a mobile device, yeah, there's not much I can do about it, but I, you can type your answer in if you like. So here's how everybody answered. The correct answer is what 82% of you voted for. It gives you a detailed look inside of the bars on any chart type, okay? Next. If you get these wrong, it's fine. It's okay. It's getting things wrong is a great way to remember something. Do profiles change based on the type of bar being displayed? 31, 31% of you, 40% of you, 50% of you have voted with five seconds remaining. 60% have voted. And you have about four seconds. Okay, here we go. Answering, do, profile, do profiles change based on the type of bar being displayed? The answer is no, 90% of you got this one right, 10% did not, it's okay. Next, what does a double distribution Low volume node fade setup require. Is it a good night's rest? Is that what it requires? A good feeling about going long? A good feeling about going short? Do I have to have feelings at all? Or do you have to have a low volume area between two large distributions of volume? Three seconds. And sold. Here's what you answered. 98% of you got that one right. Two of you are jokers. Paying <laughs> a good night's rest. I mean, when there are no stakes, you didn't have to pay to answer, right? I think the answers would be different if you had to pay to answer. With VP, this next one, with VP, I can simply trade the setups whenever they show up without looking at the current action. True or false, 
You have 15 seconds with 50% of you voting. 60%. Got eight seconds. 66%. We're stalling. And closed. Here's how you answered. With VP, I can simply trade the setups whenever they show up without looking at the current action. That is not the case. Now, the where the market's located in the narrative makes a huge difference. That's why backtesting requires you to have a robust system. So 92% of you answered false, 8% of you answered true. The answer is false. Can't just jump in anywhere just because you saw a setup. You need to assess what the market has done, how good of a job, what the market has done, what it is trying to do, how good of a job, and what is likely to happen next, then you look for the setup. You have to establish your bias, then look for the setup. So this question here is, a VP ledge is a legendary VP trader. Like the British like to say, oh man, that guy's a ledge, meaning a legend. A sudden drop off in volume from one price to the next due to multiple rejections. 64% have voted. And we're out of time. Here's how you voted. I'm telling you, there's some jokers in here. And I like it. 98% of you said that it's a sudden drop off in volume. And then two more, two more, and then I'll let you go. This one is asking, a VP ledge setup can be traded as a breakout from the inside out to catch a trend. And it can be traded as, a, 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 it may be used as a pullback retest entry for a counter, a counter move entry. Six seconds. Done. And here's what you said, survey says. 92% of you said both. It can be taken as a breakout or a pullback test, which is correct. We just covered this. And then the last question, last pop quiz question. A developed and consistent trader must maintain a strong grasp on the mouse he or she uses to, to execute trades the edge of their desk right after putting a trade on because of the stress of trading, the latest books, indicators, and courses, and a developed and consistent trader must maintain a strong grasp on the market narrative and context so that trades being put on can be allowed to, to work and won't be overmanaged, okay? Be detached from the events. So, that's the last question, closed, share. And that's right, 97% of you answered correctly. It really is important to have a grasp on the narrative as a trader. You can't sit down and just put on a trade, I'm telling you. you it might work here and there, but in the long run, over a large enough sample, statistically speaking, it does not have an edge. Some of you are jokers. 3% of you are jokers. And I like that. But that's the pop quiz. I'm going to scan real quick here with the help of our buddy Landau to see if there are questions that weren't answered. So before we let you go, Rodrigo's asking, how does 68% <clears throat> is only true if the profile is a normal distribution? If the distribution has a different kurtosis or skewness, plus or minus sigma would not be 68%. That is true, but uh, that is exactly right. But we are, we are, we are trading. So this is a, a, a rule of thumb. The, the kurtosis is gonna cause 68% to become narrow, but one sigma is always 68.2% regardless, okay? Yes, this webinar is recorded and will be distributed to all registrants. Can you explain what a four tick Renko is again? Four tick Renko is just a type of chart. 
it's just a, a type of chart. I invite you to just type Renko charts trading in Google and see what it gives you. Uh, Colton is asking, can you explain what a gap and go is? I did. I will, you'll get the recording and you'll be able to listen to that. And Kevin is asking, would you discuss how you weigh recent volume exact daily, daily versus long-term volume when building your understanding of current narrative? Excellent question. Smart guy. The most recent auction is the most important. So what happened this morning, if I'm in the middle of the afternoon, is more important than what happened last week. Then I go to yesterday and see what we're doing now versus yesterday. Then I look at what yesterday and now did versus last week. That's the volume profile chart or the daily composite chart that I show every morning in the uh, 9 a.m. Trader Bytes. So this is a weekly, so I can see that the market here has tried to push away and has come back. This is for the ES. This is in real time. You can see where we closed. We closed right on top of the weekly developing point of control uh, today. This is telling me that the market is starting to find balance potentially. So I'm weighing next week versus today's action and so on and so forth. This is a lot like somebody who starts with Day, monthly charts or quarterly charts goes to monthly, goes to weekly, goes to daily, and then goes to hourly to do their analysis. With volume profiling, I look at the most recent auction and I move out. Okay. I'm going to leave you there. This has been very long, I know. Um, but hopefully you're caught up on what volume profiling is and why it's different. Uh, this is this is a view of the market that I developed in 2005, long time ago. That's how old I am. 15 years ago, it's become a lot more popular since. More and more platforms are offering volume profiling, but these are basics. This is just an overview. There's a lot more to cover, especially on execution and how you use volume profiling to establish a bias and then figure out a location to execute and then executing and managing trades. Again, we talk about this all day, every day at Convergent. Go to ct.pro forward slash April 21 offer and punch in VP April 21 to get a discount, to have a month's look. I always wanted to build to build a community. It's the best way for me to build, to uh, exercise my vision, to impact as many traders positively as possible. Okay, good luck. Thanks for tuning in. A recording will be on its way soon. Take care.